as we reach that last verse <laughs> of the hymn. Tonight the message is entitled Tipping Point, and as you know from what uh, I said this morning, we may be at a tipping point here in the United States with what's going to happen on Tuesday. Certainly by the time we get to June 30th, it will be a tipping point of some sort as to which way things will tip here in the United States. We're going to be talking about the principles related to that because that actually is what is in the next part of the passage in the book of Acts. But I failed to mention this morning, uh, within this past week, one of the state decisions has been handed down concerning that young couple that you saw this morning uh, who refused a uh, gay wedding and the state Supreme Court has told them that they must pay a fine of $130,000 for refusing to bake a wedding cake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For um, uh, a lesbian couple. A fine of $130,000. You can see how this will affect Christian businesses that wish to take a stand for the sanctity of marriage as God designed it between one man and one woman. It could drive Christians out of every form of business if someone insisted that they had to do their particular business for the gay wedding or gay civil union. A lot of legal maneuvering is going on right now. The one state that has stood strongly and firmly against it where the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of that state, which is Alabama, Chief Justice Roy Moore, uh, has fought and pushed back. All the other states have collapsed when federal courts have begun to interfere with states' rights. That is, doing things outside the limited constitutional framework given by the United States Constitution, all things that are not specifically mentioned in the Constitution as belonging to the federal government are supposed to be reserved to the states. And yet we see a, an incredible federal encroachment in many different areas and Christians have sat back and paid no attention to that for years. For example, <laughs> federal government involved in education. Education is a matter reserved to the states and yet the federal government through holding out the carrot and then holding out a stick has made many states comply with certain elements of education that are destroying the education in our country. There are many other areas as well, we won't talk about those, but a key tipping point in what happens to a nation is this issue of legalizing and legitimizing a sodomite relationship where it becomes the norm for the country. And as you look over history, every country that's done that has gone to ruin, has come under God's judgment has been destroyed. So it's a rather serious issue for our country and the message tonight is entitled Tipping Point, though not specifically on that issue. At least we'll be covering some of the principles which relate to a tipping point from the way in which God looks at things. So let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of being here to study your word. And Father, we pray that you might guide and direct in all that is said and done here tonight, that Jesus Christ would receive the greatest amount of glory. Father, we pray that you will help us to be wise stewards of what you've entrusted to us, especially the time that we have, for it may not be long. Certainly the energy and resources, so that we not, might not squander our energy on things of the flesh, or our resources on things that do not count for eternity, but that we might use wisely that which you've put into our hands, because someday we will have to give an account for it. And so, Father, we pray for your blessings on your word as it goes forth tonight. To the glory of Jesus Christ, for we pray it in his name. Amen. Now, as you know, back on April 12th, which was two weeks ago, because we had our missions conference last week, but two weeks ago we looked at tentmaker ministries. In Acts chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, After these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth, and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to be deported from Rome, and came unto them. 
And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when we looked at that passage um, two weeks ago, we noticed Paul's flexibility in his ministry strategy. He was flexible in at least three different ways. First, he was willing to move on after he had established a foothold somewhere else. Athens, as we noted, which is where he was on Mars Hill in the preceding chapter in chapter 17. Uh, Athens was a cultural capital. Corinth was a trade capital. Athens had a lot more of moral wickedness, but Corinth was the sex capital of the ancient world. There was a saying to describe the moral debauchery in the ancient world to play the Corinthian. Secondly, we saw that he was willing to work to support himself where there was no external support. And that's why many ministries today in closed countries are called tent maker ministries, because it's dangerous or impossible for the missionary to work in that area unless he has uh, what the government considers a valid trade that is enhancing the area in which he's living. And we looked at a good number of different types of tent maker ministries that missionaries use today uh, as they go to the foreign field. Uh, medical missionaries, for example, that's uh, one of the oldest tent maker kind of ministries because everybody wants to fix their body. <laughs> Most people don't care about their souls, but they do care about their health. And so medical missions has been a very big tent maker ministries over the centuries. Agricultural missionaries, educational missionaries, industrial missionaries, establishing factories and hiring local people. And we talked about uh, one of the videos we saw some time ago from Frontline's mission about a tent maker ministry, which is actually uh, an expert coffee roaster who has gone to a closed third world country uh, to run a coffee house and share Christ with people who come into his coffee house. And so we saw that Paul's father apparently had uh, insisted that Paul learn a trade so that if things didn't work out in his rabbinic training, he could always have something to fall back on. And we talked about how today there are very few men in seminary that have any kind of multifaceted training and background. So if a man wants to go into ministry today, he needs to be willing to get his hands dirty, to do hard work, to support himself, to support his family, and not just to expect that God will drop an already well-established church into his lap and pay him a salary to which he'd like to become accustomed. Uh, unfortunately, most of the young men that I went to school with at Dallas felt that way. And uh, I gave you illustrations of various men that I know uh, who were involved in tent maker ministries, including a close personal friend in Israel uh, who went as a tent maker uh, and now has pastoring a church because he's led over 200 people to Christ in that uh, city. And, uh, but because he never had any theological training, now he's going back to school, back to Bible school, so that he can get theological training. And sometimes I think, sometimes the Bible schools actually ruin men who are already uh, very gifted in ministry. So I hope that doesn't happen to him. I talked about the different things that I've done over the years when churches couldn't pay me to be a tent maker and to earn a uh, living to support myself and my family. So, unfortunately, too many people, especially young people today, who have never learned the Protestant work ethic, uh, too many want the world to be handed to them on a silver platter. But that's not what Paul set the example for. The third thing we saw was he was willing to work in a subordinate position to Aquila and Priscilla, even though they were among his converts. The fourth thing we saw was he flexed back to his original style of going first to the synagogue, where he reached both Jews and Greeks, and that's specifically stated in that text. We noticed also the sovereignty of God in providing for Paul. Aquila and Priscilla were in Corinth because they had been driven out of Rome as Jews. God uses persecution to move his people to new locations where there is something special in store for them. And we noted how this pinpoints for us the date of this particular section of the book of Acts. We saw that God can move his people in times of rebellion and gave the illustration of the Tower of Babel uh, where Israel was moved to Assyria and to Babylon and uh, many different times where God uses the rebellion of his people to put the clamp on them and move them someplace so that he can develop something in them. We saw that God can move his people in times of persecution, which is what, of course, we have in the book of Acts, where they all were hanging around at Jerusalem. Jesus had said unto them, you're going to be witness unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. They all decided to hang out in Jerusalem, so God sent persecution. And it says they were scattered abroad everywhere except the apostles. So God can use persecution to get us moving in doing the thing that he wants us to do. And that may be what's happening here in America, where God is going to start moving some Christians around because he wants the gospel spread. And so we will not be able to be so provincialistic as we are, where we sit in one place, we go one road to work, we come back home, we go to bed. We get up the next morning, eat breakfast, go one road to work, come back, eat dinner, go to bed. Uh, God may move us where 
to a very uncomfortable position out of our comfort zone where we must present the gospel of Christ. God can use times of famine to move his people. We saw Jacob and the sons going to Egypt. We saw that God can move his people in times of blessing. For example, moving Abraham to the promised land, which was actually not so um, culturally well established as where Abraham had been in Ur of Chaldees. We saw that God can move us when we don't understand. It tells us specifically in the book of Hebrews that Abraham went out not knowing where he went. And we need to remember that we don't resist when we sense the call of God on our life. Just make sure that it's his call so that you will be more effective servant like Paul with Aquila and Priscilla. And then the final key principle that we learned was, in reality, God has called every member of the body of Christ to be tent makers, using the platform of our occupation, our location, even in retirement for the spread of the gospel of Christ. And of course, last week was Mission Sunday, and that brings us full circle to what we studied on April 5th, which was repentance and judgment. The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from them, howbeit certain men clave unto him, and believed, among them of which was Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Very important introduction to what we have to say tonight, because it shows the impact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the future, not just on the present. Not just how we live right now, but on the future that is to come. Because of the resurrection of Christ, judgment is coming. Because of the resurrection of Christ, we can be guaranteed that God will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, even Jesus Christ, as Paul says in his sermon. The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof in that he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he raised him from the dead. The ignorance of which Paul speaks is a willful ignorance. All around us, people are being willfully ignorant. They know there's a God there. They know he's the creator. We've talked about this in detail when we've discussed Romans 1, 2, and 3, which I alluded to this morning. The light of creation, Romans 1. The light of conscience, Romans 2. The light of special revelation, that is the Bible, Romans chapter 3. Men are held accountable for what God has given them in terms of his revelation. And the light of creation is available to all men. But they have willfully, ignorantly rejected the light that God has given to them. But there comes a point in time, and it's clearly determined in advance, and it's guaranteed by the character of God that we're going to look at tonight, as described in our passage, when the last man, the last woman, the last child will be saved, just as there was a point in time when the last person got on board Noah's ark and God shut the door. Man didn't shut the door. Noah didn't keep him out. Noah preached. He was a preacher of righteousness for 120 years. And they laughed at it, and they put it off, and they delayed. And they said, maybe someday, maybe someday, but right now we're having too good of a time. They were marrying and giving in marriage until the day that God shut the door, Jesus said. God shut the door. There may be somebody here in this room or somebody who's listening over the Internet that's been putting it off. I think the day is coming very soon when God is going to shut the door. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time to get right with God. Now is the time to repent. Now is the time to turn to Christ. Because if you don't do it, there will come a day when God shuts the door, a cutoff point. And it is coming, and I think it's coming soon. If you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, not the next day, not next week, not a month from now, not when you finally see the last thing about to happen, then you trust Christ, because when it happens, it'll happen in the twinkling of an eye. And it will be too late at that point. If you've heard the gospel, you will not trust Christ. You will be deceived by the Antichrist. God himself will send you a strong delusion that you would believe the lie, who believed not the truth or received not the love of the truth, that you might be saved. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. If you've heard the gospel now, and if you reject Christ now, 
when the rapture takes place and God pulls his people out of this world it's guaranteed that you will believe in the Antichrist because God himself will send you strong delusion that you will believe the lie and not the truth at that point it's too late for those people who have not heard the gospel there will still be some who get saved but for those who have heard the gospel and rejected there's a cutoff point well we'll talk about that more in just a little bit God opens doors God shuts doors and when he shuts them no man can open them Revelation chapter 3 verse 7 speaking of Christ says he is the one that has the key of David he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth we know there's a predetermined time set by God because Paul said so because he hath appointed today Acts 17 31 in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead the resurrection of Christ guarantees the future judgment that's why social do-gooder types of Gospels are totally irrelevant and cannot save you we talked about how the resurrection is the key to the Christian life. We talked about the resurrection as the key to the eternal expectation of the believer in heaven. We talked about how the resurrection is central to the New Testament doctrine of judgment to come, and that's precisely how Paul used it in this passage. We pointed out that most phony evangelism never mentions judgment. They never mention judgment. They just talk about how God has a wonderful plan for your life. We noted that because there is, in fact, sin, there is a need for repentance. We saw that repentance is necessary to avoid judgment, and that's a major theme of the Bible. We looked at many passages in the Old Testament where God called individuals in the nation of Israel to repentance. So we're not going to repeat all that here. I'm just summarizing stuff for you so we can get back on track where we skipped all these weeks. But here are the principles that we learned both in the New Testament and Old Testament about repentance from sin. When we moved to the New Testament, repentance was the message of John the Baptist. Repentance was the message that Jesus preached. Repentance was the message that Jesus gave to the disciples to preach. Preaching repentance was part of Christ's great commission. Repentance is the only way to escape judgment in hell. Repentance is the key to experiencing the benefits of forgiveness. Not to get forgiveness, but to experience its benefits. There has to be repentance. Repentance is listed in the book of Hebrews as basic beginner doctrine in Hebrews chapter 6. That's one of the the foundation doctrines, the, the things that lay the foundation, the groundwork. If you don't have that, you don't have a solid foundation. Repentance is central to the principal sermons in the book of Acts. Paul clearly preached repentance in the age of grace, which we're living in right now. Peter preached repentance. Repentance can be too late. We saw that with Esau. You know, afterwards, when he would have repented, he sought it carefully with tears but couldn't find it. There came a cutoff point for Esau when he sold his birthright. Repentance is a key requirement to escape judgment in the prophetic book of Revelation. Repentance results in a changed life. That's how you can tell whether someone has truly repented is, has it affected their life? Has their life changed from the sinful patterns that they used to live in, and now are they seeking to glorify God by the way in which they live? Repentance causes joy in heaven. Well, now that brings us to our passage for tonight, and that's very important background, <clears throat> because... Repentance is a key point at which there is a tipping, either toward the bad side or to the good side. We didn't talk about it, but repentance can come too late for a nation. We find that in the days of Josiah, the nation of Israel repented, but God still decided to send judgment because of the sins of Manasseh. They'd already reached the tipping point in the days of Manasseh. So even there was a reinstitution of the Passover, even though there was a repentance of the people as a whole, they were already on the downhill slope and there was no way to stop before judgment hit the nation of Israel. I hope that's not the case with our country. I hope that there's still the possibility of national repentance that will keep us on the upward path instead of continuing to slide down as we are seeing happening all around us right now. So that brings us to verse 5. Acts 18, verse 5. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. Here's a tipping point. Paul's at Corinth. 
Paul has been talking in the synagogue. Paul has always gone first to the synagogue. At this tipping point, it was one specific city, one specific group of people that hardened their heart. And this was the tipping point where Paul, who was called to be the apostle of the Gentiles and was already reaching Gentiles, he said, from henceforth, I go unto the Gentiles. And so we find most of the rest of the New Testament written to Gentiles. How thankful to God we are for that. God in his mercy has opened the door for us that he sent Paul. But there came one group of Jews, one generation, one group, one synagogue, one city, which made the difference in the way in which the gospel would then go. And they were cut off. They were let out. The door was closed. <coughs> I hope that it's not Collingswood. It could be any group of people. But there is a tipping point. A tipping point in the life of individuals where they make a final decision. They will either trust Christ or else reject Christ. There are tipping points in congregations where they resist God just long enough not doing what they are supposed to be doing, where the tipping point takes them down. There are tipping points in denominations. We've seen that. That's why this church came out from the national organization, the PCUS, PCUS which is now PCUSA. <clears throat> there are tipping points in nations. There will be a tipping point when God finally decides to judge the world, takes the church out, and the tribulation begins. A tipping point. Think about your own life. Are you reaching a tipping point where because of your recalcitrance, your reluctance to do right, your decision that you will do it only your way and no other way, regardless of what God says, that it's good enough the way you're living your life now? Have you reached a tipping point? Oh, you're saved. You're on your way to heaven. But God pulls players off the field. God ceases to use you as a useful instrument. You cease to be put in opportunities whereby you can share Christ. He'll give it to someone else tipping points. When Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. It was a tipping point. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. I did my job. You made your choice. You suffer the consequences. I've seen certain friends and family members reach tipping points in their lives. Some made the right decisions, some made the wrong decisions. We saw a tipping point this morning when the Pharisees accused Jesus. The whole people were saying, is not this the Messiah? And they said, no, he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. That was a tipping point for the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And Jesus said that was the unpardonable sin because they said, he hath a demon. Mark chapter 3, verse 30. We read it this morning. Tipping points. Are you paying careful attention to your Christian life? Are you near the edge somewhere? Where you're on the edge, just sort of hanging on and showing off that, hey, look at what I can do. Like the fool kid taking his hands off the bicycle handles and saying, look, Ma, no hands. And he rides around the block again. Look, Ma, no feet. Rise around the block again. Look, Ma, no teeth. <laughs> Tipping points. Sometimes we need the motivation of other people to get us moving with our central mission of proclaiming Christ to the difficult audiences that we've been sent to reach. I think that's what's going on here. Verse 5 says, When Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Now, you know, Paul has already been witnessing to the Jews. It told us already that he's gone into the synagogue. He's been reasoning with them. But it says, 
he was pressed in the spirit. Two others came along. Paul realized, you know, things are not moving here like they should be moving. We need to get this project going. And so he began a change in the way in which he presented Christ there in the synagogue. In the previous chapter, Paul had, had no problem or hesitation proclaiming Christ to the pagan Gentiles, the Greeks. That was at Athens. But from this passage, it appears that he had a different approach in presenting Christ to the local Jews at Corinth, at least when he first began. He'd been using temperate reasoning in his presentation based on scripture, and we've seen that in every presentation that he made in synagogues and Acts. But when Silas and Timothy arrived, he began to be forceful and blunt. Sometimes preachers have to be forceful and blunt. People don't like it. Have you ever felt that this preacher here was putting some pressure on you? I hope so, because I've tried to, to get you to do what's right, to prove your integrity, to do what's right. Dear folks, that's what happened with Paul here. He'd been using temperate reasoning. He's been showing them patiently, 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 patiently what they ought to do. To show integrity. To believe what the Bible said. But when Silas and Timothy arrived, he began to be forceful and blunt. In other words, when there is a hardness of heart at the continual well-reasoned presentation of Christ, it's time to be blunt. And if rejection continues, as it did here, it's time to move on. It says in verse 4, he reasoned in the synagogue of chapter 18, he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. He was using articulate reasoning, and Paul was quite skilled at that. He was not a stumble bum. The Apostle Paul could present a very articulate picture of Christ out of the Old Testament. He knew it well, probably had the entire Old Testament memorized. When was the last time you memorized a Bible verse? When Silas and Timothy arrived, they confirmed what Paul said. And this is a very important principle. Two more came. Paul was there all by himself. You remember that? He was waiting for them. When they came, Paul began his blunt approach. Why? Because we've already studied the principle, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So Paul had been reasoning out of the scriptures with these Jews, but not getting any kind of a response. But when Timothy and Silas got there, they confirmed what the Apostle Paul had been saying. We've covered the principle of the mouth of two or three witnesses in detail in the past. We've seen how God always, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, uses that principle in proclaiming his truth. And that's what I think we see going on here in this passage. But there are five steps of progression that are set out in the passage before he moved on. Let's look at those five steps here together. First of all, step number one was respectful, tempered reasoning. When he used that, we saw the result in his audience. They ignored the truth. You know, don't always expect folks to respond to your reasoning. It, they don't. I've discovered this after 40 years in the ministry. You can present things and 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 people stare at you with a glassy stare and it goes right over their head and you ask them later what was the sermon about and they said, um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, what did the preacher preach on? Um, he preached about sin. Well, what did he say? Uh, he was against it. <laughs> Listen, folks. You've heard me say some things, a lot of things, a lot of times, which are foundational truths like creationism. I didn't hold a creation conference this year. I get no response. We're not holding any more creation conferences. But that's foundational. You saw it this morning as we talked about it. You saw it when Paul was preaching on Mars Hill in the book of Acts. But I'm not going to do it anymore. You've reached the point of no return on that one. I'm being blunt with you right now. First, respectful, tempered reasoning, and then being ignored by the audience concerning the truth. Second, we find multiple witnesses to the truth and the rejection of the multiple witnesses. 
Then we find a forceful drawing in the line of a line in the sand. And when Paul did that, there was blasphemous rejection. It says they blasphemed, they opposed themselves, and they blasphemed. Verse 6. And then we find Paul moving on. That was the end of the opportunity. But right at the end, some key people believed. We're going to talk about them later, including the ruler of the synagogue. There were some people who squeaked in the door at the very last minute. When the Jews continued to reject Paul's presentation, now they had a forceful rejection with blasphemy. When they did that, he shook off the dust from his sandals, so to speak, and moved on. Oh, but, you know, he didn't move far. You know where he moved? It tells you in the text. He moved right next door. <laughs> he moved to the house of justice. And I suspect they could probably hear Paul preaching through the wall because that's where he continued to meet with those who responded. That was the mercy of God. Paul could have moved to another city, but he didn't. He moved right next door. And suddenly he began to have some response from people who had not had the privilege of hearing the gospel. You know, God does the same type of thing, the same five steps, in his character quality of long-suffering. That's a very important character quality of God. If God didn't have that character quality, you and I would be frying in hell right now. We need to understand that even though God is long-suffering, there does come a point of no return. God is especially long-suffering with sinners. But eventually he closes the door as he did in the days of Noah. And after that point, nobody was able to enter the Ark of Salvation. At the outset, there's a difference. Let me make this clear. There is a difference in the Bible between long-suffering and patience. Those are two different Greek words that are used, sometimes in the same context, which indicates that they are distinct one from another. What is the difference? Patience, if you're taking notes, patience is learning how to deal with difficult circumstances in life. Patience deals with circumstances. Patience deals with life as you know it now. Patience deals with putting up with lack of money, lack of good health. It deals with putting up with a difficult government or difficult laws. Patience. Different difficult circumstances in life. But long-suffering is different than that. Long-suffering is learning how to deal with difficult people in life. Patience, difficult circumstances. Long-suffering, difficult people. And that's how we see it being used of God. As you go through all the passages of Scripture, there are 17 places in Scripture where it talks about the long-suffering of God. 17 of them. Let me give you some of those. God himself declares long-suffering to be one of his core character qualities. We see that all the way back in the book of Exodus. We haven't gotten to this chapter yet, but we'll see it when we get to chapter 34, where God hides Moses in the cleft of the rock and goes past him. And here's what God says. The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, all capitals, that's Jehovah. The Lord God, that's Jehovah Elohim. Merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. First place it occurs is where God declares himself to be long-suffering, where he states it as one of his core character attributes. We find that long-suffering is connected to mercy and to forgiveness. Very important. We get over to Numbers chapter 14, verse 18. The Lord, again all capitals, that's Jehovah, is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation. In other words, long-suffering is not God simply saying, well, I guess I just won't pay any attention to sin. God says, but I put up with it, and put up with it, and put up with it until people come to repentance. But if somebody doesn't repent, they're going to see my judgment under the third and fourth generation of those that hate me and refuse to obey my commandments. Be thankful that God is long-suffering. 
because when you repent and turn to Christ, you see multiple generations being affected by his long-suffering and goodness of your own progeny. What tremendous promises of the Word of God. Wish we had time to go into those tonight. The next thing that we discover is not only is God's long-suffering connected to his mercy and forgiving, but God's long-suffering is an extension of God's grace and mercy and truth. Psalm 86, verse 15. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. An extension of his compassion, his mercy, and his truth. We find that God's people can appeal to his long-suffering in times of distress. Here's Jeremiah suffering some terrible things. And Jeremiah writes and says, Lord, I, I sure hope this isn't your judgment on me, because I've, I've tried to do your work, you know, but I am suffering. Listen to what he says in Jeremiah 15, 15. O Lord, thou knowest, <coughs> remember me and visit me and revenge me of my persecutors. Take me not away in thy long-suffering Know that for thy sake I have suffered rebuke. When you're going through the difficult times, that's one of the character qualities of God that you can appeal to. God had been very long-suffering all the way up here through Acts chapter 18 with the Jews. Been very long-suffering, but there came a tipping point. Now, we as believers who are seeking to do the will of God can appeal to the long-suffering of God when we're going through those difficult times in life. That's what we see with Jeremiah there. We discover something else that ties us back into what I had mentioned a moment ago, how this makes us a full circle here. Romans chapter 2, God's long-suffering is designed to lead us to repentance. Remember all those things we just listed, where we saw all the different principles of repentance all the way through both Old Testament and New Testament? How Jesus preached repentance, how the apostles preached repentance, how the, the, the apostles not only preached repentance, but then others preached repentance after them, and we see that all the way through the book of Acts. We find it in all the epistles. God's long-suffering is designed to lead us to repentance. Romans 2.4 Or despisest thou the richness of his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Be thankful that God is long-suffering and continues to show goodness and continues to show forbearance, forbearance because God designed it to lead you to repentance. That's true not only for unbelievers as he is long-suffering with them and lets them lead lives and as we've mentioned before, oftentimes unbelievers live longer lives than believers and we saw that out of the book of Job where Job was couldn't understand that. He didn't have a New Testament perspective on the character of God. He thought you do right and God blesses you. You do wrong and God curses you. And all the way through the book of Job, that's the main complaint. Lord, I did right. How come I'm suffering? Many times, as Job points out himself, the unbelievers live to a good, ripe old age. They see their children, their children's children, their great-grandchildren. They have plenty of money. They have good health and strength. You know what that's all about? Paul tells you here in Romans 2. It's designed to lead them to repentance, to see that there is a loving God who has provided for them. And we talked about that when we discussed the issue of common grace. But God also used it in the lives of believers. God could slap us upside the head instantly every time we do wrong. Boy, that would keep us on the straight and narrow. And the only reason that we'd serve God was out of fear. But God has designed his long-suffering to teach us to serve him because we love him. Those are different motivations, folks. The law is designed to make you fear God. But that doesn't produce a relationship. Love produces a relationship. Paul says it was the love of Christ that constrained him. That's why he went and preached, not because he was afraid that if he didn't go and preach the gospel, God was going to zap him out of some commandment in the law. He says the law slew me. That doesn't work. But because of love. The long suffering of God leads you and me to repentance so that we will respond properly to the way God wants us to 
to live. We learn more about long-suffering as we go through Romans chapter 9 and verse 22. Long-suffering stops, God's long-suffering stops the mouths of those who claim that God has not treated them fairly. Have you ever had anybody say to you, well, God just isn't fair. Look at all the bad things that are happening in the world. And they blame the bad things on God rather than blaming the bad things on sinful man. But listen to Romans 9.22. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? Now, as you know, Romans chapter 9, 10 and 11, in fact, all three of those chapters are dealing with the sovereign elective purposes of God, with predestination, with the fact that God makes choices and God makes the choices based on his own character and on his own plan so that in the end his people receive the greatest amount of good and God receives the greatest amount of glory. That's what Romans 9, 10, and 11 are all about. And it's within that context that Romans 11:26 tells us that there's coming a day when God is going to go back and he's going to rescue his national people Israel and at that point, so shall all Israel be saved. But they've got to go through the tribulation first. But Romans 9, 26 makes, uh, 11, 26, excuse me, makes it very clear that there is a coming a day when the Lord Jesus Christ will fulfill his promises concerning the messianic kingdom on earth with him reigning in Jerusalem for a thousand years. That takes place, though, after the great tribulation period. But God keeps his promises. The long-suffering of God, even to those who are vessels of wrath, you know, that means those who are not elect, those who reject Christ, those who want nothing to do with God, those who are the brilliant atheists who are out there trying to argue against God, and many of them, now dead, are in hell, because even though God was long-suffering with them, they continued to reject. The believer is to reflect the long-suffering of God in dealing with others. That's point number 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 6. By pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, you and I are supposed to be reflecting the character qualities of God. And Paul lists a whole list of them here. Pureness, knowledge, long-suffering, kindness. By the Holy Ghost, by love, unfeigned. That means genuine love, not fake love. Not this plastic grin on the face, you know, where behind you're, you're frowning, but you've got one of those Mr. Potato kind of grins, you know, they, those plastic things they used to stick into potatoes to make faces on the potatoes. Some of you are old enough to remember those potato man faces. You take one of those and you're frowning, so you stick a plastic potato face on there with a big grin on it. No, love unfeigned. Genuine love, not fake love. Long-suffering is also a key element in the fruit of the Spirit. In fact, it's generated by the Spirit and listed as number four on the list. We all know the first three, love, joy, and peace. Oh, yeah, fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, and peace. You know what the number four is? Long-suffering. You and I, if we are reflecting Christ, those are the ninefold character qualities of Christ that are summarized for us in the book of Galatians, in Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. You're either controlled by and moved by the Spirit of God, or you're controlled and moved by the law. Either it's by love or by law. Either by love or by law. Either by love or by law. The power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the flesh. Power of the Holy Spirit, power of the flesh. Faith or works. Faith or works. Those are your key themes as you move through the book of Galatians. Which is it for you? If you're controlled by, indwelt by, filled with the Holy Spirit, you will produce the fruit of the Spirit. And the fourth character quality of the fruit of the Spirit is long-suffering, where you reflect Christ, where you reflect God the Heavenly Father, dealing with recalcitrant sinners who refuse Christ and blaspheme against him. But there's coming a day where there's a cutoff. We see it with God. We see it with Paul here in our passage tonight. Long-suffering is how we are to deal with other believers, not just with unbelievers, as we see Paul doing here in this passage tonight. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. This is how we are to treat one another, with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. You can't do it if you don't love the brethren. You, you, know, you can hang plastic bananas on an oak tree, but that doesn't mean the oak tree is growing bananas. If you are not motivated by the love of Christ, you will never be able to put up with the other believers. Because God didn't choose the best. God chose the bottom of the barrel when he chose me and when he chose you.
Paul says so in 1 Corinthians. It is very difficult to put up with Christians. Have you ever discovered that? We are a difficult people. We are just like Israel was in the Old Testament. We are stubborn. We are rebellious. We are recalcitrant. We are disobedient. We reject the word of God in favor of the word of man. We decide we're going to do it our way instead of doing it God's way. And we just don't care what somebody else says about it. But we're supposed to be long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. Number 13, long-suffering can only be generated supernaturally in the life of the believer, which ties in with that previous one, Colossians 1.11. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. So you've got both of them back-to-back, -back, patience and long-suffering. They are not synonymous. Patience dealing with difficult... Anybody? Circumstances. Long-suffering dealing with difficult people. Yes. You can't do that in the strength of the flesh. You have to be strengthened with all might according to His glorious power unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. It's not just a matter of tolerating it because you have no other options. It's with joyfulness. Did you know joy only shows up in the context in the New Testament? Joy only shows up against the darkest backdrops in times of difficulty. It's like taking a diamond perfectly cut and you could put it on a, a dirty old oily rag from the garage and it wouldn't show up very much. You put it on white and it doesn't show up very much but if you put it on black velvet and then you shine the light on it it sparkles and glistens in all of its beauty. Uh, you, next time you go to a jewelry store hunting for diamonds, I hope you don't do that very often, but uh, look at what they do with it. I heard a, a speaker not too long ago, just a little less than a year ago, very, very excellent, interesting speaker, talking about going into one of these stores and the way in which they present. At that point, he was buying a pen, and he was buying, I don't know if it was a Mont Blanc or some very exquisite pen. They wanted $17,000 for a pen something you write with. <laughs> they took him into a private room. They dimmed the lights. There was this central table with this velvet over the top of it. On the velvet, mounted in a special holder, was the pen. A single spotlight coming down on the pen. <laughs> what a privilege to buy such an instrument. Oh, the salesman was cool. Folks, you know, when your patience and long-suffering show up the most, it's against the darkest backgrounds, and that's when joy shows up the best, too. When everything's going your way, you can't tell the difference between joy and happiness. Happiness relates to circumstances. Joy is in spite of circumstances. It has to be produced supernaturally. The next thing we learn about long-suffering, it is not connected to pride. It is connected to humility, to meekness, and to kindness. Colossians 3.12 Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. We discover that the believer who understands his own sin realizes how God has been long-suffering with him. Paul says so as he writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.16, Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. When you consider who Paul was, that Paul was a persecutor of the church, that Paul was so zealous that he went to other cities, binding men and women and bringing them into court, and when the, the vote was to put them to death, he cast his vote to put them to death. He stood by and held the clothes of those who were stoning Stephen to death. Acts chapter 7. God could have said, you know, that little worm down there is getting in my way. You know, he, he's, uh, he's putting a, a, a crimp on the spread of the gospel. I'm going to smush him. Paul says, I look back at that with, with trembling in my heart because I realize God was long-suffering with me so he could use me now and he's going to teach me things through the things that I have to suffer. But he's also making me a pattern. It's very interesting. The word pattern there is, is for something that you, 
have a light underneath, and then you lay down the pattern on top, and then you trace around the pattern on the next sheet of paper that you put down so that you get an exact image. And God did that with Paul so that he could set an example for us of what the Christian life is like. And it's not all candy and roses. But it has a faithful reflection of Christ in it. Jesus' life was not all candy and roses. It was not all total acceptance. It was rejection and humiliation and spitting and shame and crucifixion. But in the end, he's victorious. That's what Paul says his life was to be. Albeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Next, we see long suffering is necessary for those who would disciple others in the Christian life. Do you want to disciple someone? Not just witness to them for 30 seconds, hand them a track, and run as fast as you can before they ask you a question. Do you want to disciple people in the Christian life? Long-suffering is necessary for those who would disciple others in the Christian life. 2 Timothy 3.10 But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Paul was modeling and was discipling Timothy. What did Timothy see in Paul? He saw his doctrine. He saw his lifestyle. He understood his purpose. He saw the expressions of Paul's faith he saw Paul's long suffering with all those difficult people he put up with. He saw Paul's love. He saw Paul's patience in the difficult circumstances. Here you've got again long suffering and patience in the same list. They're different. Paul went through it all. We discover that long suffering is essential not just in discipling others, but we see that long suffering is absolutely essential in proclaiming the Word of God, in discipling and in proclaiming at all times. That's what Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.2. Preach the Word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. you got to have content. But when you're presenting it, and you got to do it in season and out of season, even with people who don't want to hear it, with all long suffering and doctrine, as we noted at the beginning of this message, the long-suffering of God reaches an end when God's plan for his people is finally finished at even any given divine juncture in history. There's coming a time when this age of grace in which we are living will come to an end. We don't like to think about that. But the end is coming. The long-suffering of God is going to be cut off. The illustration that we mentioned before that Peter again gives in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20. Speaking about those people who rejected while Noah was preaching and building the ark. It says, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. They weren't saved by getting wet. There are people who try to take that passage and say, you see, you're saved by water. You've got to get baptized to be saved. That's baptismal regeneration. That's heresy. In the days of Noah, who was it that got wet? Noah and his family or all the people outside the ark. And they didn't just get sprinkled or poured on. They got immersed. And by the way, there's a difference between immersion and dipping. Immersion means you stick it under and leave it under. Dipping is where you put them under and bring them up. So nobody really practices immersion. Uh, they practice dipping. But... Hey, the people who got wet there, the salvation was they were saved out of the water. Don't use that as a baptismal passage. And finally, there's one final point of long suffering before the judgment of God comes to an end again. And it's coming to an end again. Peter tells us what it is in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 and 2 Peter 3, verse 15. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. Why hasn't Jesus come? You say Jesus is coming again. Ah, come on. Been 2,000 years. Where's Jesus? The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But, why has God waited so long? But, is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance? The long suffering of God is because God is still holding the door open. And you and I are supposed to be the ones through whom the gospel is being proclaimed to people around us.
And then chapter 3, verse 15. 2 Peter 3, 15. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. There's no difference between the message Paul preached and the message that Peter preached. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, Peter was the apostle to the Jews, but they preached the same doctrine. They preached repentance. They spoke about the long suffering of God, and how the long suffering of God, the goodness of God, leads us to repentance. Not just for unbelievers, but we've seen tonight already also for believers who are not doing what God has called us to do. Account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. How we thank you for your long suffering. Father, we know that it'll come to an end at some point. We know there's coming a day when the door will be closed. When judgment will fall on this earth. But already you demonstrate that to us with your long suffering coming to an end and judgment falling on individuals, on churches, on denominations, on areas of a country, on an entire country. And someday the door will be closed where your judgment falls on the entire earth. Help us, Father, to be busy about our Master's business. Help us to understand that as most of us are involved in what's called tent maker ministries, that we are to be busy proclaiming the gospel of Christ in whatever context, whatever circumstance, whatever position in life, whatever age in life we find ourselves. Because it's your long suffering that is holding back the judgment, the wrath to come. And you are being good to those who are, through your common grace, being good to those who are still in rebellion against you. And Father, we pray that you might use us as instruments to reach them with the good news that Christ died for their sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Only you can regenerate, but you use your word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Make us faithful instruments in proclaiming the word of God so that others will hear and that you will be able by your spirit to regenerate them through faith in the living Christ. Father, we commit this passage and this portion of Scripture that we've looked at tonight and thank you for your long-suffering to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, our closing hymn.